All right, should we start? Welcome, everyone. So, my name is Ringo. Um, as my colleague Lee Briggs this morning, I work for Pulumi, but yes, I'll show a bit of Pulumi, but it's not going to be a pep talk about Pulumi. Um, I'm going to pick up a bit where Lee left off with the comparison on imperative and declarative tooling and the statements around that he made. Um, because yes, you still see once in a while a debate on whether imperative or declarative um, is the way to go. So here is one tweet, here's another uh, to go on the long running battle. And yeah, then some people even yeah, think I, or say, I prefer declarative or I don't like that imperative thing. And that's not going to be for me make up, hey, help you make a decision. I'm just going to try and, and show you that um, to end the, the debate actually is just the debate in your own mind huh? and show you that both aspects um, help you to hey, have their value. And not so long ago in the same room there was a very smart guy who said or tweeted the following. A hot take. Things can be both declarative and imperative. Trying to turn these properties into marketing wedges makes you ignorant, not smart. Thanks, Adam. Now, coming back to these definitions and also what Lee showed this morning. So with an imperative tool, typically it's you orchestrate the steps, um, but yeah, to find out what was already there is mainly up to you. With a declarative tool, yeah, you defi do your, a, define your end state and the tool will make sure that it tries to comply with that. Yeah. Um, now, a tool can be, as Adam mentioned, imperative and declarative at the same time. But what is the overall behavior that your tool manifests? Yeah? Is it really fully imperative? Or do you have somewhere an, an imperative interface, but in the end, a, a fully declarative behavior? Yeah? And this is mainly what um, I look at when evaluating tools and see what I can get out of it. Yeah? Um, when I did uh, software engineering, because I'm coming from a software, software engineering background, the only way how I improved my knowledge of databases, for example, is when I started to run the explain functionality or the SQL analyzer on my statements. Because only then, at, at that moment, I understood more of the inner logic of a database server and how it worked. And this helped me considerably writing faster programs. So, with both of these pieces, look at what you can do with the tool in the end. So, coming back to the imperative part is, you have a number of subsequent runs of your infrastructure code and yes, on a first run, typically both an imperative and a declarative tool will create all of your resources. But what happens on subsequent runs? With an imperative tool, because you orchestrated the steps and the actions to do, well, your tool will create them again. Yeah? And if there is any conditional on your provider itself, which prevents you creating the same resource twice, well, that will fail, and then it's up to you to do the error handling, etc., etc. So with a declarative tool, which knows what it already uh, done before, well, it takes it into account and says, yeah, but this and this and this already have, done. Yeah? And we're over. Um, with this definitions in mindset, uh, in mind, actually, let's see Chef as an example where you already mix imperative and declarative constructs. Then, so this was actually a tool I landed upon uh, when, let's say, do, the, the war was raging between Chef versus Puppet. Um, then two of the tools we use today, Helm 
and of course Bulumi, my employer. And then a new kid on the block from Solomon Hikes, his new company and his new product is Dagger, which is actually conceptually, and I'll come to that, also a combination of imperative and declarative, but to orchestrate your CICD pipelines. So first off, Chef. Yeah, I just mentioned I'm coming from an, a software engineering background. So for me, it's actually, yeah, I'd rather use a programming language. So the team for Chef started with Ruby as the base programming language and added a domain-specific language on top of that. Yeah? On top meaning they leveraged the Ruby constructs to make it as simple as possible to have a, a very shorthand notation to uh, make sure to define your resources, um, but leveraging what the power of the Ruby programming language already has. In uh, a chef setup, you had some concepts, and I'm not gonna dive too deep into that, but everybody knows about the resources you want to ma uh, manage. Well, one resource is the minimal Thing you could uh, orchestrate with Chef, then you put resources together um, in a recipe and a recipe together in a multiple recipes together in a cookbook. So if you take the example of an Apache server that you have to manage, well, the installation of the Apache package on your OS was the minimal resource. Together with the package, probably we need some additional config files, so that could be together in an install recipe. And then you had next to the install recipe, more configuration recipes, also an, a delete recipe, etc. together making up the Apache cookbook. If you have a small example here, so coming back to that, the first line of this was already doing something, so in this you got a package resource, and you gave it the name install Apache, and then you provided an additional block starting at the uh, do on the first line until the end on how you configured that package object, yeah, that package resource. And in between, you already see that there is a regular case statement coming from the Ruby functionality. So based on what the platform attribute of our node was, yeah, if it was Red Hat CentOS or another derivative, yeah, the package name um, needed to be HTTPD. If it was an Ubuntu or Debian derivative, yeah, the package name was Apache 2. So here you already mix up DSL that Chef made with pure Ruby constructs. So this is a simple example, um, but when you execute it, it's still declarative. As long as your node doesn't change and you're running that on the same node, the first execution will install that package, but any subsequent runs will already find that the package is installed and then it will skip this resource declaration. Yeah. The power <coughs> comes actually when, yeah, you go further. What if we need to install more than one package? For the sake of the um, demo, I know uh, Adam can correct me, you can have a whole um, array of packages immediately behind the package name, but just mixing it a bit more with some Ruby code, you just make a list of packages, and for each package in that collection, you again pass it the block, but in this case, it's a block with an argument. So the PKG is substituted each time, each run, let's say, of that loop. The first time with Apache 2, second time with Rails, and then the package block will be evaluated, and the first block, uh, the first evaluation will install the Apache 2 package, the second evaluation uh, of that each argument um, will install the Rails package. Now, yeah, these are this is an example where the list of packages is hard-coded. Now, doing a step further, and there, that's for me where the power comes with mixing imperative programming languages and still having declarative tooling, is where you can even say, okay, let me fetch that file of approved packages from an internal server from somewhere that could come from your yeah, auditing uh, or a security department. 
They review the list and publish that somewhere. And when we have to run it, we download that. And for each package in that, um, which is listed on a separate line, for example, in that file, we do the same construct. So this is, in short, why actually I liked Ruby, because I could mix in anything which was already available. And I wasn't limited to what the chef team already constructed for me. Going to the current days, well, people for Kubernetes use Helm. Um, so if you ever touched on Kubernetes, yeah, Helm, Helm charts and yeah, probably after step two, eh, after you fiddled first with applying a kubectl apply and you did some initial testing with um, pure handwritten uh, YAML files. Um, so Helm is considered a declarative tool. Now it does have some imperative aspects to it. Yeah. So again, small example. So this is um, a snippet coming from uh, the Prometheus template. So I only took the first 22 lines, but part of it is already static, um, yeah, part of the, of the Helm file, but it is mixed with some imperative constructs because on line fir A1, you can already see an if statement. On the first um, line, the, the part behind it is actually the dot operator coming from the Go templates. So with the Go templating engine, you are mixing in your yeah, values which come from a an, an, an separate uh, location and you, tr you mix that in to see, okay, if, that, if some service is enabled, well, yeah, then indeed I have to generate the whole file because this if on line one, yeah, I didn't have the whole file, but it ends at the end of um, this template file. Next to that in the file, you see on line seven, for example, you see a two YAML and also at the end of the line an indent. So here you have an additional two functions um, and looping further, uh, it's in total, even on 22 lines of uh, YAML templating, you see an invocation of six um, imperative constructs. The if, a to YAML, an include, the indent, then on line 10 you have an n indent, and on line 14 you see uh, a templating of even another property, which is uh, yeah, even going further. Together with the dot operator, that mixes in quite some uh, logic. But on the other hand, it's only limited to what the Helm authors actually um, allowed you to. So they started with the Go templating uh, library and they added the Sprig template library to it, which gives you sort of uh, around 60 possible functions that you can invoke but it, there it ends. And here are a few of the categories of functionality where these 60 functions uh, are, um, can be categorized in. So this is not extensible without contributing to the project in a whole and with, even without having your changes accepted to uh, uh, the project. That's for me quite limited. And on top of that, yeah, this is yeah, glorified manual code generation or YAML generation. It doesn't really, uh, the fact that I even have to do the indenting and, and selecting the indenting myself, it's awful. <laughs> um, so the, the previous two, so Chef and Helm, what is common to these tools is that these are all, uh, the tool itself all runs in the same um, language runtime. So Helm is a compiled binary. It was uh, written in Go. Uh, so this is a static binary. All of Chef runs in a Ruby environment. Um, so this is uh, the setup, single process and uh, done. So coming to Pulumi, there is a bit of a different angle here. Because yeah, people know Terraform, and you have Terraform binary, you, uh, you have the providers, that's already two processes. But the language handling of the Terraform DSL also happens in the same Terraform CLI in that uh, binary. 
Bulumi extracted actually the language processing also as a separate process and now we have a setup with three processes communicating with each other so all of these three types of processes run on your machine when you're running Pulumi. Yeah? Now, if you run a Pulumi program, you have your language host, which you selected, so either a JS ecosystem, even Go, .NET, um, uh, the Java ecosystem uh, as well. So this is actually coming back to the directed acyclic grafting where your language host actually orchestrates how your graph of resources need to become. So the language host in the end doesn't really provision anything. It's still our engine who does it. And that's what in the beginning confuses a lot of people because they think, oh, I'm writing my infrastructure code in, imp in an uh, imperative language. Uh, everything will be running exactly and in the same order as uh, I wrote in the code. Well, too bad, no. And that's why I'm gonna show you s in a small case actually how and where still the power of our engine comes from and where you have a lot of flexibility to do that orchestration and creation of your resource graph. So this is a small example, very straightforward if you worked with AWS before. So we create a VPC, we create an internet gateway, a route table which is linked to both of them, uh, to both the internet gateway and the VPC, and then separate from it, but also linked to the VPC, is a security group. So first part is if we create the VPC, well, that does actually a register resource request over that gRPC channel to our engine. So in the very first phase when your application is running, this is just sending instructions to our engine on how you want your resource graph to look. <coughs> if we create a second resource, and there you see on line eight, um, there you see that I'm referring to the ID of the VPC which was created just before that. Now, as I mentioned, the VPC at that moment hasn't been created yet. So that ID thing, what am I passing? So it's not the actual value of the uh, ID. No, you can really look at it as a bucket where our engine will later on put the actual value in. But by passing that bucket from one resource to the other, here you create a link and a vertex in the end in your directed acyclic graph. Because here you see that then my internet gateway depends on my VPC. And that's a good indication for our engine later on to order the creation uh, of uh, the resources. So next up is in the, in the end the route table. Here you see two references to, to other resources on line 15. And we refer to the idea of the internet gateway. And on line 18, again, the same VPC ID. So that makes up the following graph by now. So the route table resource points to the two other resources in the graph. Completing that, we have a security group and that only points to uh, the VPC. So now our program has ended executing, but that doesn't mean that Pulumi has done working. So now actually comes the, the part where our engine will start using this resource graph and then compare it to the state similar to how Terraform does it and uses the providers to do all the proper um, uh, creation calls. Yeah? And if this is the first run, yep, so then we really uh, are triggered with a, the, all the providers are, in this case only one provider, the AWS one, will send the create calls for all of these resources. But in which order? Not in the sequence as um, the program made, made but um, yeah, if you, based on graph theory, first of all, what needs to be, which actions need to be done? What are the dependencies? And then we, uh, our engine tries to group these. So the VPC is definitely the first one. Then you have two resources only depending on the VPC. So that's the security group and the internet gateway. 
And as a last resource, actually, we end up with the route table only after the VPC and the internet uh, group, uh, internet gateway rather, has been fully provisioned. So the order is actually out of order as what you expect from um, the, uh, the sequence in your application. Given that, yeah, the more complex your um, resource graph becomes, the more opportunity we have to run the creation of uh, resources concurrently and to limit the time it takes for your infrastructure to come up. Um, so looking at, again, the imperative and declarative thing, actually, Pulumi is an, has an imperative language setup which drives a declarative engine, which in the end uses, again, imperative calls to fulfill the desired state because our Pulumi providers, similar to the Terraform ones, have a CRUD protocol, create, retrieve, update, delete. So this is really an imperative way. But by, driven by the engine, yeah, it makes sure that it's the engine in the end which is key to the whole Pulumi setup, making it declarative as the outcome of its total behavior. Um, in short, this is what uh, the Pulumi setup coming to the next um, one, the new kid on the block is Dagger. So the problem with, and I've encountered that multiple times, is I hate debugging CI pipelines. Because I always have to do a commit, I have to push it, I have to try it out, rinse and repeat. This is actually one of the premises that Solomon Hikes, the founder of Docker and now Dagger, yeah, which he thinks is, yeah, why can't we have a setup where even with containers, we can test our pipelines and uh, do it locally yeah, before we push it off to the hosted service and where the pipelines can then run happily after they're locally debugged. So the high level setup and the high level architecture of Dagger is actually quite similar to the Plumi one, although its purpose is totally different. So, with the Dagger SDK, you also write your pipelines in code. If that application runs, it sends instructions to the Dagger engine, which also creates a directed acyclic graph of all the different build actions which depend on the outcome of previous steps. And that's what you model in the end also with the Dagger SDK towards the Dagger engine. Once Dagger is um, a let's say, uh, fed with all the model that you wanted to um, have your pipelines to be, well, then it's Dagger Engine, which uses an OCI container runtime and starts off really executing these. Now, the nice thing about that is that they apply, um, they use Docker primitives or container primitives and check are my inputs in my subsequent runs, are they the same as my very first run? Because if, if I'm feeding the same source files to be compiled a second time, well, I probably know that the outcome of my binary will also be the same. Yeah? So unless there is nothing changed to the inputs, Dagger says, well, skip this step. Hereby also improving v a lot on the round trip time of also just testing and building your application. Um, so this is um, the architecture. How does it look like? Well, they already have an existing TypeScript SDK. This is a very small thing of how you can, uh, let's say, build a Node.js application immediately with three different Node.js major versions. So from the Dagger package, online one, you start with importing a client and the connect functionality. You connect with an asynchronous callback function because, yeah, Node.js, asynchronicity is core to a lot of these things there. We have a simple list of major Node.js versions. And then we say, OK, we first mount the host files, except for the node modules, which we use locally. And, but all the rest of the sources we mount as a volume into a container. But which container? Well, on line 14 you see that we are creating a container, but node passed in with the node version. So this is already looping over these three different versions. 
and already having starting parallel pipelines to build and test in each of these different uh, runtimes. So once we already have done the container started from a standard Node.js version, we um, execute the client again and we say, with that container, uh, mount our sources as slash SRC, uh, make it also the work directory, and then run npm install. Actually, this should be better. If you already have a locked uh, package file, of course, this should be MD npm CI, but nevertheless. Then once the dependencies Node.js-wise are installed, from there on, we again run npm test, which is then probably a standard test target in the package JSON as a script and done. And then we await the runner to complete um, the build phase if the testing was uh, done. And if it's OK, yeah, all the output files are exported again to our host file system, but under Node.js specific output folders. So what you have here is in code immediately the setup for three different versions. And the nice thing is you can test this locally. You have full code completion on all the constructs in, um, to build up your pipeline. And yeah, I like code. So I fancy this. Um, now, yeah, I've shown all these examples. But why do we want all these aspects? Why do we want both aspects? Well, for me, the main thing, and definitely if you heard the term platform engineering, is integration. Yeah? I want to integrate, and we're talking um, about DevOps for years already, and breaking down silos and collaborating with everybody. But yeah, let's collaborate if each of our tools live on an island and we can't integrate. Yeah? And that's what I like actually about the code approach is that you have a very easy way to integrate with tools that other teams use just by uh, using and reusing the code. You know, it's not only about writing some infrastructure code then and, for example, running Pulumi up. No, it's what can I do with that code that I can even integrate with more ecosystems. Yeah? So, and there's two ways, in my opinion, of uh, definitely if you're going back to tools like Terraform, Pulumi, uh, uh, two levels where you can integrate. First of all, more and better integration with, uh, between ecosystems. And uh, I'll show you a few, uh, an example later on. But also then using and trying to embed these tools even in bigger and, and uh, bigger automations. Yeah? So the thing is, the first is, OK, the ecosystem thing. Um, yeah, people choose AWS CDK. Now, at first sight, this could look like an AWS CDK program. But actually, it's a Pulumi program where we, as is, import AWS CDK constructs. And I'm looking to my far right, because part of the work has been still been done by Paul Stack. Um, so in here, we only changed one thing. That's actually in the middle. I forgot to add line numbers here. It's actually that we are extending a Pulumi CDK stack. Yeah? So your core AWS CDK has already some uh, standard CDK stack classes. Well, we only replaced one. But for the rest, the last two lines, for example, are from directly from the AWS CDK libraries is the EC2 VPC and an uh, ECS cluster uh, construct. But by wrapping it in a Pulumi CDK step, we remap that, and these become Pulumi resources. So this is one thing. Now you have your cluster running. So of course, now you need to install uh, application on your cluster. So next step is, of course, yeah, we can also tap in into the Helm charts eh, that people already invested time and money in. So these are not lost. So Pulumi-wise, we also um, just <coughs> download the Helm chart, we, you process it, you pass the values that you want to be passed on to the Helm chart, and we deploy it as Pulumi resources. Now, behind the scenes, what we do actually is a Helm templates equivalent thing. Um, but then we remap this and use our Kubernetes support to deploy that um, 
directly as the native uh, Kubernetes resources. The nice thing is also is um, at the last lines you see what we, we try to look up um, somewhere in that Helm chart there's a service deployed with a certain name so we do a lookup and then we take the IP which is in the end attached to that ingress and we return that as a Pulumi output so that th that can be used later on to connect to it and to do uh, very other stuff like register a C name for example etc etc. Um, so I show these two examples separately, but in the end you can even mix uh, all that together with more native Pulumi resources and done. But the nice thing even further is, and that's then the, um, the second time, uh, the second uh, example of integration is building even bigger automations out of that. Yeah? What if you don't want to just run Pulumi up, but you want to give your developers a tool which immediately sets up approved infrastructure? So that's where you can either create a new CLI tool which embeds Pulumi or which um, uh, adds it to a workflow engine which runs um, uh, multiple steps of um, setting up infrastructure based on a, a new client signing up automatically on your website. Well, whatever. Yeah? This is all your yeah, brain power, your imagination, which is only the limiting factor to what you can do with code. Yeah? And to close up actually, the, uh, how does such, such an automation API example look like? Well, on the um, <coughs> top right, this is actually the, an, a, a normal Pulumi program, but in an async function. Yeah? So the, you pa and then this function is actually passed on um, a line, the one from line 15 in the example top right. You pass that on in line 32 in the example left. And then you actually have code which sort of simulates the same steps you would do otherwise manually. Running, Pulumi up, Pulumi refresh, whatever, setting config, uh, this all in code. So this is now taking Pulumi, adding it to whatever you want to build, and then shipping that to your users, your customers, whatever. Yeah. So coming back and wrapping up to the message I want to bring is, yes, I've shown the bit of Pulumi, but the main thing is if you're picking on tools, uh, or selecting tools rather, make sure you understand the power, its shortcomings, um, and see if it still fits the bill. Yeah? What fit the bill two weeks ago might no longer be the case today or tomorrow. So make sure that whatever you choose, that you can collaborate, that you can integrate with either the rest of your company, with partners, companies, etc. Yeah? And with that, I'll leave you. <laughs>